right now. Welcome, welcome everybody for Clear Vision Wednesday. I am Claudia Mühlenweg. I'm the creator of the Natural Clear Vision Method. I help people improve their eyesight naturally. And this podcast or vodcast, as you might call it, is all about vision improvement. And every week we're going to look at different topics, different aspects. And today's topic is about helping your children see better. So maybe you have grandchildren or children and they got glasses or they have vision problems. You're like, what do I do now? And I have a guest here and she's going to really help us dive deep into this topic. Let me bring on um, Orit Kruglansky. Welcome, Orit. Hi, Claudia. How's it going? Hi. So you've been on my podcast before and we talked about, because you had written an amazing book and I now forgot to pull that off my bookshelf uh, called I See Clearly that was written for children. And, you know, you realize how many adults are buying this book, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about yourself for those that haven't seen your our previous interview. Um, how did you get into this? And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about your background. So when I was around seven, I got glasses and then, you know, I grew, the glasses grew. Um, and from the one and a quarter diopter I started with, I ended up with like eight and a half diopter glasses. Um, and then at about 38, I discovered that I said improvement is possible and decided to do it and took off my eight and a half diopter glasses. Um, and then in some sort of uh, time travel intent, I wrote this book for children, uh, for the child that, uh, you know, the book that I needed when I was a child in order to improve their eyesight. And kids really love it and adults love it too, because it's all about how to improve your eyesight through play. But uh, after the book, um, you know, the book was uh, translated to several languages and a lot of people bought it and kids really get it. They just take the book and they play and, and they don't need anything else. But parents who have the responsibility and who have to make decisions they felt that they need more information and they would ask. And then as the questions you know, accumulated, I started writing this other book um, that is the new book, Play Your Way to Better Eyesight. And yeah, it's a sure. guide for parents. I'll pull that book a little bigger. So that's the book for parents, um, Play Your Way to Better Eyesight, exactly. Um, so thank you so much for, so you're back on, people were asking, you were nearsighted, so you had a minus eight and a half diopter, which is a really strong, prescription for nearsightedness. So here's an example of somebody who did it. Um, so yeah, so I I personally, so my my background is we have a similar training in the Bates method, and then we kind of added our additional things to that, whatever we learned throughout the years with our own vision and with working with clients. And I get emails all the time from parents, and I used to work with children and the parents in person in my practice here in Los Angeles, and I stopped uh, I closed my practice end of last year and I haven't worked with children for quite a while now. And uh, because honestly, I just, I, there was too time intensive for the private sessions. And I always thought like, I, I, here's the thing, what I found, like the parents wanted to like help Johnny see better, give him some exercise. I'm like, no, no, we have to work with you so that first <laughs> of all, most parents also have vision problems, right? Have you noticed that too, that a lot of times? Yeah, of course. They're like, fix the kid. It's too late for me. And it's like, no, the, the kid won't do it. If you don't do it, the kid won't do it. And I talk about it in the book. They're, they're like um, the parents who want the children to do it, but they don't want to do it. They're sending like a confusing message. They're telling their children that it's actually not worth doing or not possible. Or, you know, the, the parents, you're the role model as the parent. Even you, if you think you're a terrible person, your kid thinks you're great. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you're not doing it, they don't want to do it either. They're like, no, why are they telling me to do this weird thing when they're, you know, hooked up to their glasses all day long? That's so, so cool. yeah. Um, so that's a great point. So first of all, and a lot of times when the parents are resisting, I'm like, well, first of all, it's important that you show, demonstrate what you just said, or I totally love that. And that you actually understand also why we're doing certain things. And now I'm so glad that your book is out. So tell us a little bit about what are the like, maybe do's and don'ts for parents um, in terms of what they, if they want to help that, that child, you know, and it, is this book written for children that already have glasses? Is it for prevention of glasses? Tell us a little bit about the, the purpose or who it's for. Well, the, the, book, is, uh, the book is both for uh, prevention and for uh, children who have already, who already use glasses or for children who are starting to not see well. And 
it really talks about um, everything around, uh, you know, losing and finding again your eyesight, uh, why eyesight problems develop, how uh, eyesight is related to strain, and to stress and to other, you know, uh, emotions. And people usually don't don't make this uh, connection, right? Because people think that uh, eyesight is something mechanical. That's like, uh, oh, my child is like, has a bad eyesight. So this is like some mechanical problem. But really, when your child is not seeing well, this is an indication that something's not going well for them in their life. And, and that's important to know. I mean, even if you choose to go the glasses way, it's important for me that you know that something is not okay. I mean, I remember when I got uh, my glasses put on, that was a very, very stressful period for me. My parents were getting a terrible divorce, which was maybe the best thing for everyone concerned, but I was you know, having a hard time and I don't think anybody was aware of that. And at school, I was not happy. You know, I didn't get along with the kids. And I remember thinking, oh, I wish I had just like more space for me. I wish the world would just take a step backwards. And then, and then it did, it became blurry. And then they're like, oh, there's a technical problem. She doesn't see well, glasses. And then what you do when that happens is you get the glasses and then you turn on the same defense mechanism again. And so the glasses get stronger. You're like, oh, she's not seeing again, more glasses. No, so it's important for me that parents understand that, that, this, um, that there's a very, very strong connection between eyesight and, f and emotions and you know how the child feels. So this is part of, part of the book, I talk about that. And the other side of that is that eyesight improvement really is all about relaxation. We all know that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, a lot of parents want to know what's the right exercise for some condition, but really what they should be looking at is, is this activity creating more strain or more relaxation? And when it's creating more relaxation, it's good for your eyesight. And when it's creating more strain, it's not. Even if um, it's this or that exercise, routine, technique, whatever. If it's creating tension, then it's not good for your eyesight. So, so parents need to like um, change their mindset around improving eyesight from something that has like a school mindset, like uh, repeat it, you know, this many times, to something that has a play mindset, which is do it as much as you like, do the thing you enjoy, do it out of curiosity. There's no, you know, there's no stakes. There's no, nothing at stake here. Just, you know, enjoy looking around, looking at detail, exploring the world. And kids games are all about vision. We, we're, we live in a very, very visual society. And a lot of our games are about vision anyway. So all we need to do is put them in the right context in a, in a sense, right? That makes so much sense. And I love how you talked about games and play. Um, because sometimes I just tell people, you know, just do more ball games, the one catch, like this kind of stuff. So um, oh, I have so many questions for you. I'm trying to think where to start next. So first of all, reframing it as play, which is what something you heard. And that's what you said in that other first book that you wrote for the children directly. Reframe it as play and not in school like exercise. It's another thing on the to do list. Right. And um, I know when a child might go to vision therapy for fusion problems, amblyopia, strabismus which can sometimes be necessary in addition to what we do. But a lot of this is exercises, 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 right? It's like pencil push-ups, like those kind of things. But so wait, Claudia, I just, I just want to say kids don't make that distinction. I mean, right. um, for kids, it can be play, even if it is exercises, as long as you feel it's play. Right. I mean, I mean you, know, you know how kids, you know, clean the, clean the kitchen with the broom and everything? They're playing. <laughs> They're not really cleaning no, the kitchen. I, I, Thank you for saying that. So, but I'm just saying as a parent, there might be more that feeling of like, okay, do this like 10 times, like you said, like abs in the gym, three sets of 10 or something versus um, noticing, also tuning in and noticing how things change. So, um, so what do you, um, what about like, do you help um, parents understand a little bit about the glasses or why they get glasses or like what what can parent what can parents learn in addition to like here specific practices, games, playful things you can do with your child, right? Do you have different vision conditions that you address or like how do you help people here? 
Mm, I, I don't really address vision conditions um, as such, because really the book is more about uh, finding the activities that, that are fun for you and just understanding how vision comes into play within, within these activities. For instance, if you talk about ball game, so um, ball game can be stressful and then it's not a good vision activity mm -hmm. and it can be just relaxed fun and then it's a good vision activity because you're also looking at the periphery because you know the ball might come from anywhere um you're looking at the detail which is the ball itself you're moving your body which is really important for vision so i go through all these things that that are the elements of uh, a vision improvement and show how they appear in different games so on the one hand you can understand um, like the, the basics of vision improvement and what's good for your eyes, um, which is, I mean, in a nutshell, it's like moving, being aware of the periphery and noticing details with curiosity. That's just like in one sentence. Um, but then just go look at what your children are already doing and see if that is um, good for their vision or not. So if they're staring at a screen at a close distance, not moving their body and uh, not aware of the periphery, that's going to be bad for their vision. On the other hand, if they're running in the park, chasing a ball, looking at squirrels, flying a kite, blowing, you know, soap bubbles or, you know, kicking around leaves, that's good for their eyesight. <laughs> no, right? So it's really yeah. um, what, I, what I'm trying to say in this book is that uh, so many activities that children love and just, you know, look at the activities that your children love already. You don't have to add like 10 push-ups. Just see what they already like and, you know, uh, joyfully encourage them to do more of that. I love that. Now, so there's two things that you talked about that I thought are really important to highlight. First of all, like, let's say ball games can be relaxing and can be stressful. And I I was one of those, I had strabismus, no depth perception, like ball games were so stressful for me because I always said I'm bad at this. But then when I eventually started doing it a little bit more, I got better and I found it more fun. But I, you know, it's right. That's why an exercise like throw and catch this ball could be the worst thing if you, if it's stressful for your child. And so that's one thing I think it's really important to distinguish, like what do children already do? What do they have fun doing it and start there? and then see all these things that they're already doing. If I go to a play store, right, for kids, like everything I see is a, is a thing that we can use for vision improvement. Exactly. Um, the second thing you touched on, which is probably the biggest thing for parents now is screens. So when I grew up, right, in the 60s, there were no, was no such thing. We didn't even have cell phones or any of that. My daughters just, you know, were just a like early teenage when the iPhone came out. So thankfully they didn't have iPad and like, so, what do you tell parents or how do you help parents? Like, what can parents do? Because it so, must be so hard right now with everybody being on screens all the time. So any tips for that? Um, I think it's really complicated, uh, but I think children um, whose parents are uh, willing to, to remove their phone and to be in full attention with the children, the children will prefer the parents to the screen. That's, you know, if you take your kids outside and you're on your cell phone, they're like, okay, that's the good thing to do. Mm -hmm. They want to be on their on a cell phone. They want to be on a screen. But if you're like, okay, no cell phones today, we're going to go ice skating. We're going to go running around chasing a ball. They're not going to pull out their screen in the middle. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little practice, but you have to be present with them. You cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot send them off to be better than you. <laughs> that's that's the one thing that, right? It's like, if you're addicted to, to your phone, they're going to be addicted to their phone. Um, yeah. This is such a good point. So, yes. Yeah, so as a, you really are the role model. Um, and I remember when my daughters were small and I would want to eat some ice cream and I told them no sugar, I didn't eat any ice cream, <laughs> right? It's like, it makes you actually a better person <laughs> because, you know, they do copy you. And I think Dr. Bates even um, found that if the teacher wear glass, wears glasses, the children are more likely to want glasses. So kids do copy their, their role, their teachers, their parents, you know, all those kind of things. So I love that. you. It really starts with the parent. Like you really have to like, be conscious of your own habits, right? And uh, 
and don't expect your children to be uh, better than you, so to speak, in terms of not being on screens. Um, that I love that. Um, let me look if we have any questions. I don't see, I just see people on YouTube. Hi, hi, hi. I don't see any particular questions um, right now. I, I want um, to say something more about, yes, about the cell phone question. I think um, uh, there's like the, the, you know, technical aspect of it. They're looking near um, at a fixed distance. It seems like a lot is going on, but you're just staring at the same distance. But there's also something else that has to do with, uh, with structured and unstructured time. And I feel that as a society, we're losing our ability to um, exist in unstructured time. We have this like constant feed of information and, and the stimulation and kids are really um, nowadays very overstimulated. A lot of parents trying to do their best are like, you know, adding a lot of extracurricular activities and, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, things for their children to be able to, you know, know more languages or do more sports. And, and I think um, the combination of those that, you know, extracurricular uh, activities that are really a lot of time, very time consuming, and um, the fact that the rest of the time they're not really resting, but they're actually engaging in this uh, constant flow of information, social connections, whatever, um, is really creating anxiety in, in us as a society. The fact that there's no, you know, you remember when we were kids and we would get bored and you would just like, you know, kick something around for a while until you got a better idea or just like do something like, um, you know, painting something you shouldn't with, uh, <laughs> you I know, know. With, your, <laughs> with your pens or something. And I think, I think that time is really important. Um, it's like downtime for our brain. It creates resilience. It creates um, uh, creativity. And the, the absence of that um, makes people more anxious. So, so the, the fact that the kids seem like they're resting while they're on their cell phones, I think that's a, that's a, a big, um, you know, we should be careful of that. Uh, I absolutely love that. I mean, that's a, such a good reminder because kids need to be bored. They need to be use their creativity and they need that downtime, that like unstructured time. And I remember when I did work with children in person, I was like, yeah, they have this, they have piano, they have ballet, they have all these things. And yes, we want our kids to be successful, right? We, we definitely want them, but you're right. There is this high level of anxiety now that if the kids don't learn everything already by, you know, age so-and-so or, it's like you lost that precious time and their brain is neuroplast, you know, neuroplasticity and all this. I think it's so good. To, and we now know that sleep for us, it's so important to restructure. And so for kids, it's not just sleep, but it's also that unstructured time where they can just figure things out without mommy or daddy, uh, mommy or uh, daddy uh, telling them do this or do this to this. So like really figure stuff out. Like we, we did, we got into all kinds of trouble, but that was part of, building our resilience and learning things and figuring solutions out. And, you know, it's, you're bringing up such a great point. Thank you so much for, for that reminder. And I do think it is more challenging for parents, especially as a parent, what I found as a parent, um, there's all the, everybody has an opinion about what you should be doing. And it's very, it's already challenging when you work in your own eyes because your friends might be like, that doesn't work. What are you thinking? Your eye doctor's like, you know, whatever, it, you already need to be strong, but now you have children where you're almost like, that's another representation of how good you are in a way or how, you know, um, I felt that certainly. And I felt right. I got really defensive when my kids were in counseling, for instance, and they, they would say you, they should do this or that one. I'm like, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. I was a single mom. So I do want to say also to the parents, it's not easy. No, I think it's important, right? Do you have any message for them in terms of what are baby steps maybe you can do if it's, you know, any anything from your end that you would tell parents to, where they can maybe make little steps? Because it's not easy nowadays, you know, there's a the whole pressure from society. And yeah, I don't I don't think it's easy, but I think it's certainly worth it. I think mm -hmm. we put in a lot of time into uh, trying to make sure that our children have uh, skills. But I think, um, you know, being with themselves and being able to uh, to just you know feel grounded, feel calm 
is a, is a very important skill and it takes time as the other ones do. So um, if you could, instead of running to ballet, decide there are only a few activities that you're gonna do and take some time to like, just be at home and hang out and do something not structured. Um, I, think, I think it's really important. And also to have like uh, spaces that are free of cell phones, just for the family to be able to talk. Um, like a no cell, cell phones at dinner policy is, is a good small step. Um, you leave yours and they leave theirs and, you know, see what happens. <laughs> so just, uh, just find these like little spaces where you can do that. Take a walk together, um, improve your eyesight together. It's a good one. <laughs> I, I think this is so great so you have to be you know I think as a parent you know I mean that was definitely for me when I my kids were four and six when I became a single mom and then you're the bad cop good cop you know you're like you don't want to always be the bad person and I remember did this experiment where I let them do whatever they wanted and they just watched tv for like hours and hours and they became these cranky monsters at the end you know <laughs> and, and so I mean my I ended up choosing Montessori and Waldorf schools for my kids when they were younger because they really helped they really had this new media policy it was really helpful to be in an environment where the school it's not just you right you're not the only person who's actually recognizing how important this connection time is that free time the creativity where it's not just academics and having that self-free zone i mean back then we didn't but if we had cell phones they would have not been allowed um, obviously when kids get into like teenage years in high school, that then that's a different story. Um, but I, I think it's so important as parents to recognize that we're not our child's best friend, that we have to make those executive decisions. And my kids didn't always like what I said, right? But I was very, I just, I just stuck to the rules and being a good role model yourself. I think this is so important. Um, there's a few questions on YouTube, but before we get to that, is there like an age where you feel like this book is not helpful and like what do you think is like the best age range in terms of parents to help their children with this help, the, the help of your book and in, uh, in general i would say um it starts at three or four and it ends when the childs are teenagers mm -hmm. so i think teenagers have so much on their mind they have mm -hmm. so much going on I don't think it's a good moment to, uh, unless unless the teenager wants it themselves, I don't think it's a good moment. And it's also a moment where, where children need to find their own personality, like to disconnect from their parents, maybe to even go against their parents to like define themselves. And so it's not such a good moment. If you wanna help your teenager, just do the process yourself, improve mm -hmm. your eyesight. Just mm -hmm. don't say anything, don't, you don't, don't try to get a teenager. I mean, in general, of course, it's like, it's hard to say something to all parents because children are different, families are different. But I would say as a general rule, when people come with teenagers, I'm like, if they are interested, then we can work. If they are not interested, then, you know, call me when they're 23. <laughs> I, I, I think this is so important because sometimes when I parents reach out to me and I usually send them to you or somewhere else. Um, but that idea of like, you know, does your child actually, you know, maybe they like the, they like the glasses. And I remember my younger daughter wanted glasses and then her vision was a little bit problematic. And I know it was the pressure in high school that she put on herself. Cause I was like, you have a B, that's great. She's like, mom, a B is horrible. You want an A and like, okay, I was glad when I had a C, you know? <laughs> um, uh, so at that point I had to let it go, which broke my heart in terms of, you know, um, but yeah, there is an age. And then later on, she came back to me and she said, what I'm doing is really makes sense because she, she started in her you know, brain and everything. And, but at that point she was just like, I don't believe in this stuff, mom. And, you know, and I, you know, at some point I, you know, you do all the, you do all the good work before, and then they reach that age. And at some point there's a little bit of letting go. And then maybe at some point when they're a little older, they come back. Um, <laughs> we have come back actually. Yeah. What, what you had, what you had with them as a child usually comes back. Right yeah. Then. So um, this is not it's just really like you, so much you need to survive teenage teenagerness as a parent, and then you're good, right? <laughs> it was definitely like I mean, my daughters are amazing, but that was definitely I would say, but was definitely a few challenging years with two daughters as a single mom. But that, there's a there's a statement here on YouTube. It's not so much a question, but 
asking my son is seven and guess he didn't do well in the school vision test and they requested he go to the optometrist. I don't want him to get lost at this age. I want to help him improve his vision. This is probably a very common thing that I heard. I'm sure you do too. Um, what would you say to Noah? Well, the thing is, um, glasses are not the worst that can happen. So first of all, I don't want to demonize glasses. Uh, if they feel that they can't see the blackboard or that they are in a disadvantage in the class, they can have glasses that live in a box and that they put on when they need to see the blackboard. It's not a problem. It's not going to um, ruin their vision for life. Because there's, there's also, you know, what I said about putting pressure. So a lot of parents go from putting the pressure on, put on your glasses to take off your glasses really should be like a no pressure thing. So um, I like to let children self-regulate, say, okay, um, do you feel you need glasses? Do you, do you, will you use them in class if you, you know, and just see where the, where the kid is at. Um, and then if you, if there's no imposition of taking, putting on or taking off the glasses, then kids usually wear them a little when they need them and then improve out of them and then don't need them anymore. Unless they have Harry Potter syndrome. That's, that, I mean, I also talk about that in the book. They, if, the, if the child really wants to have glasses, then I would also go with that. I would get them no diopter glasses or reduced diopter glasses or glasses with, you know, no, uh, <laughs> no, no uh, glass in them, you know, just like a frame. So it's a so it's a toy. It's like no, um, really. The, the most important thing is that it's not stressful. So you need to kind of check what's stressful in in your case. What's more stressful for your child? So if you get really motivated that you need to improve their eyesight or that they can't have glasses, that's that's a stress. That's like saying you need to get the A, but just in like in the vision improvement department. That is such a good, that's such a good feedback because we as parents want the best for our children, especially if we have glasses ourselves, we know, you know, that might not be the good thing, but it, again, addressing yourself and um, in working that and then putting no pressure on the children. And I remember sometimes couples where the mom was like, take the glasses off and the dad was take the, put the glasses on because they weren't agreeing. And that is so much tension on the child. So I love what you said in terms of letting them decide and maybe it helps them relax a little bit, but also, you know, doing your own thing and educating them, reading your book and helping the child. And, uh, and sometimes I would, I mean, I don't know how you feel about that. I'm curious about how you feel about it, but let's say sometimes I had children, they said, I really hate that school. I get bullied and, you know, and I would, so sometimes I would even suggest, would there be another school option? You know, could, if that school is for some reason, you know, not working or how, or maybe go to counseling. You know, when, when we went through the divorce, I sent my daughters to group counseling for divorce of children of divorce and it really helped them. Um, so what do you sometimes recommend in addition, let's say they go to the eye doctor and they get glasses. Is there anything else that you would recommend for parents to do? Of course, it depends on the situation, but certainly the first thing I would say is look for where, where the strain is coming from. Mm -hmm. what what is going on in your child's life if they're getting bullied at school that's something you need to address eyesight or no eyesight it's like it's something you need to address if they're not happy if they're feeling miserable if they have no friends um if they have they um they have a new you know younger brother or sister and they're feeling left out if they're whatever's going on find out what's going on with your child why why is their vision blurring and then when you find that out, if you can make a change, make the change. If you can't make the change, go to counseling or get some help. And, uh, and then, you know, the, sometimes the glasses just even go away by themselves um, when, you, when you deal with the actual problem. Certainly before you use the glasses, before you start using glasses and the eyes are not, um, are not habituated to this other way of seeing, um, it's much easier for the eyes to just like spontaneously uh, recuperate. Although it happens also when when you have when you're wearing the glasses. So uh, yeah, I would certainly look for the the real problem first. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important to recognize and be curious about your child. And 
sometimes, you know, I remember I was doing the best to keep the divorce from the kids away and just, you know, and then I remember this one day when my older daughter said, I was like upset or crying a little bit. She said, I'm trying so hard to make you happy. And that broke my heart. I'm like, oh. that's not your job. You know, like I felt like, oh my God, like, but they oftentimes they're carrying these things and, you know, especially if you're a single parent, but even if you're, you know, not a single parent, children might not really express because they know that you're already struggling to pay for the school, whatever. They might be really not able to express truly what stresses them out. So that's another thing I think to consider. But really, I love what you said about finding the reason why their vision got blurry, you know, and really be interested and in, let the child tell like about things. You know, I sometimes ask the kids like, what class do you like best? What class do you not like? Or you know, kind of really being interested in their life and seeing what could be a potential cause for their vision. Like you said, you know, you got, your parents went through a divorce. I was too little. I was three years old when I got my glass. So I don't really have a memory of what happened, but, um, you know, I love what you said, basically trying to figure out what, what could be a trigger of stress in that child's life. Right. I also want to say, um, to parents, don't be perfectionists. You cannot do it perfectly. There's like, as in anything else in life, you cannot do it perfectly. Your children will mm, have problems, will deal with difficulty. Um, it will not be perfect. So you can just relax. Just, you know, <laughs> do, what, do what you feel, do you, what you feel is right, what you feel is good. And uh, yeah, don't, don't put so, so much pressure on yourself either, you know? <laughs> I, that's a great message. I definitely, like I said, as a parent, you know, you, everybody has an opinion, the school and, you know, whatever it's sometimes, but really empower yourself to, you know, to trust yourself. I think it's so important to be, to find the strength in yourself and do those things. Thank you so much. I'm looking if there's any other questions. Oh yeah, there's a question from Slava. Oops. Now suddenly there's a bunch of questions. I would like to know if wearing sunglasses for children is beneficial or damaging to the eyes especially in areas like in the snow, at the beach, on the, at the ocean, and in the mountains. Thank you. Um, in general, the eyes have a mechanism that regulates the entry of light, and sunglasses are usually not necessary. The only moments, and they're really like, you know, some specific moment that sunglasses might be helpful is when you uh, change you know, if you take a plane from from winter to summer and you go to somewhere where there's a lot more light and your eyes are not accustomed to it, then maybe you'll need sunglasses for a bit. Or if you go to the snow and you don't, you know, um, to not get uh, the reflection. But it's it's really just moments that that I would say use sunglasses. As a general rule, I would not use sunglasses for anything. Great. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. For that and then there's some comments that you know uh Vanetta said she used to substitute teach and Sonia said they don't have as much recess anymore in school and you know like basically all the shenanigans that we used to do and you know it's basically it's all it's very focused on academics and very little creativity and and that's why um that's definitely I think an observation that's not so much a question that is you know and it's maybe even different here in the US you and Spain but I feel like overall it's it's kind of a worldwide phenomenon where we really kind of cut the first money that gets cut is for art for music for you know all the things for our physical education and all that stuff it's where usually the money is you know cut off first um okay um let's see i'm looking if there's any other questions um yeah so noah wants to know as a parent where do i start with healing vision um anything in specific that you can address that because obviously we have your book we have this, we have the other episode with you. Anything in specific you want to say? Where would, would somebody start? Um, start by going outside. Start by going outside. That's, you know, the best uh, vision practice um, that has all the elements of good vision is just being outside because you're always looking at different details. Things are coming from all directions. Um, you're moving. Uh, you're not between walls. You're not looking at one point, just go outside, look at the clouds, look at the leaves, uh, kick around some leaves if it's autumn, go to the beach, build some sand castles, go outside. Love that's, that. That's, that's the, best, the best place to start. Yeah. Thank you. That is amazing. That's so simple. And right. And we could all benefit from that, even as a parent. So 
I don't see any more questions on YouTube. So um, we will have a little extra powwow here in the Clear Vision Club on Zoom. Thank you everybody for watching on YouTube. And by the way, make sure to subscribe to my channel, but also to um, Orit, we have her um, Facebook, we have her Instagram, everything is linked. Her website, tell us a little bit how people can get a hold of you and what you offer um, before we close on YouTube. Right. Um, I, I don't work with children online. I do work with parents. And uh, more than anything, I, I think the, the training that, that I can offer online is training for parents to um, to do the process in their own family in the way that's fitting for them. Um, I don't like to have children in front of a screen uh, doing visual activities in like a very small space. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to have a free training in, in a bit, in a few weeks, I think, that you can sign up for. You can get the book and um, you can just write to me and uh, or get on my email list. So that's... Uh, Thank you so much. That's really helpful. So yeah, have free training. We linked all of that. You yep. also have an Instagram account and yes, reach out to Orit and she's going to help you um, work with, uh, like you said, with children. You don't want to work online with children, but you can educate the parents. And that's really what matters most, right? It's not the few minutes that we spend with a child, maybe. Thank you so much. And we will continue our discussion here on uh, the Clear Vision Club on, on Zoom. So goodbye, YouTube. We see you next week. And somebody asked where the replay is. Obviously, this video on YouTube, once we end the live stream, becomes the, the replay. Um, it's the same YouTube video later on. 